uh, we had a count, and there are many, many of you who haven't handed in your field trips. Please, don't let me beg again. I don't want to be like my mom. I do. I do in the nice way, yes. Um, I'd like to immediately start, because I know um, Mr. William McCombs' time as CEO of Liz Claiborne and the wonderful things he's done, which he will tell you about, to bring a change and bring it forward as all fashion houses must be aware that time goes by and you have to, he'll, he'll tell you, I'll stop talking. But I'd like to tell you just a few words about Mr. McCone's background. He is, you know, he's CEO of Liz Claiborne. He's a member of the board of directors there. He also serves on the board of tech no serve, and many other important endeavors, which he can tell you about. He was born in Columbus, Missouri. Columbia. Columbia. <laughs> yeah, my voice is really coming through. My it's goodness. like Wizard of Oz. And he earned his, bat someone t t uh, earned his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Miami U of Ohio, right? Correct. And his MBA from the University of Chicago my husband's favorite school, he went there too. And I'm not going to say any more because it's already quarter after and I want Mr. Perfect. McComb to take away this. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna lean on this, don't worry, it's okay. I'm just gonna lean on it, don't worry, it's, it's solid. See that? Oh, it isn't solid. It's a trick. I think it's stable now. You are? I'm not. Nice. Don't worry. I promise. Sit down. Don't worry. It's okay. I'll, this side is really stable. That side isn't. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Time for some coffee talk. How are you guys? So I, I know you get a lot of people to come and talk, and sometimes it's interesting and sometimes it's not. I really, I, I kind of want to direct my comments toward things that you might be interested in. So I'll start out and, and give you a little bit of background and overview on what we've been doing in our company. I've been there two, almost two and a half years, and I was like a tornado, an F5 that came through the place. And we're halfway through what is a five-year turnaround at the company. Some things you know about because they're very visible, and some things you don't know about. So I thought I'd uh, talk for just a few minutes about the company, and then I thought what I would do is um, give you some advice. Like if I were in your seat, what, you know, what would I be, how would I be thinking? And, uh, uh, that'll probably be the more interesting part. The first part, um, as Alice said, first of all, you know, she gave you a teeny little bio on me. When I first came to the industry, it was, it took the street by surprise because I came, I was company group chairman of Johnson & Johnson's medical device business. So I was in orthopedics and neurology and cardio stents and I'd go into operating rooms and not shopping malls and I had worked my way up there. I had started, I was, I'm a marketer, and I had started in consumer products. And so I ran their largest consumer products companies, the Tylenol Company, and Motrin, and Imodium, and Pepsid, um, their, their beauty care business. And then I went on and ran their largest pharmaceutical company, and then medical devices. And so for me, th this, while well, this is, was a, a big change, I have gone into different industries my whole career and I have learned to land on my feet. I'm really, I'm a businessman and while it, uh, a lot of people ha had questions as to why would they bring somebody like that in, there was a logical reason and that was our company, we had grown, we had blown out of what was the amazing one-off opportunity, our corporation, Liz Claiborne Inc., founded in 1976 when America was literally being mauled Malls were opening in every city and expanding at a breakneck pace, and women were going back to work. And they needed career wear that was affordable. And Liz Claiborne had this unique idea that women shouldn't wear the Jones of New York or Evan Pacone, you know, gray or navy blue suit and frilly tie. Women should go to work as women, and they should express their femininity, and they should express their style, and they should have what designers bring, but in career wear. And with the, with the coincidence of those two things, there were malls being built in every city, two or three of them, and every city had its own brand name department store, and they needed a mass resource. Add to it the third dimension, 
which was that Liz's husband, Art Ortenberg, had the big idea, literally the big idea, to go to China and build an office and secure buying agency agreements with the largest factories there and to do it themselves in China and rather than manufacture in small scale in the US. And what basically what China let them do was manufacture at a very low cost in very large volumes. And they built the first real supply chain involving Far East, um, basically offshoring of manufacturing, which, as I said, allowed them to do high design at a low price in very large quantities. And that's just what the world needed, and off went the company. Um, the company grew and grew and grew, and you know, it, it, it's a very interesting case study of two, you know, four entrepreneurs over 50 years old starting their own business and it going. It was the fastest IPO initial public offering of a public company to hit a billion dollars in sales in the history at its time, which was a big deal. It put Liz Claiborne on the cover of Fortune magazine, Forbes magazine, and it was a big deal in town. Um, and with that huge volume came access and capabilities that were unique to the industry. And what ended up happening was, as just as quickly as malls were built, the industry began to stagnate and department store chains began to consolidate. And what is now Macy's used to be over 18 different local department store chains. And as it consolidated down, it also compressed the growth opportunity. And my predecessor, who was CEO of the company for 14 years, had a philosophy that all of the skills and capabilities that made Liz Claiborne so uniquely great could be leveraged across other brands. And he began what I refer to as the acquisition era at the company. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and talk to you people like you're an MBA class, but in a second, you, you know, what I'm going to tell you is how important the business side of the equation actually is. Uh, something unfortunate happened in the, in, the, in the company. While they made some very smart and good acquisitions, they, the company, the culture in our company moved away from design and moved away from a focus on merchandising. And it got very focused on banking and finance and buying companies and in acquisitions. And so by the time I got there, we, what we had done was we had accumulated 49 different brands. And while we were very global, we were still overly tied to the US department store. We were still too much about women's sportswear in the better or moderate zone, as it's referred to. And more importantly, we, we hadn't built a truly creative culture. And what I found when I arrived, and, and frankly why the board hired, why they went outside of industry, was they, they needed somebody to actually address what was becoming a big problem. We had a portfolio that wasn't positioned for success. I always said we were an inch deep and a mile wide. We had all these businesses, but not enough to really grow any one of them disproportionately. Back in the day when Liz Claiborne was the brand, it was the single-minded focus of the company. We had subordinated design and merchandising, like I said, to the point where it was it sat underneath finance and sales in the, in the organization structures, and we stopped attracting the best and brightest people. And so the very growth engine of the company, the vitality sign with the consumer, was really hurting. So I embarked upon, in advance of the depression or recession or repression, whatever you call this economic firestorm that we're living through, a, a radical change in the company. So I got rid of 20 of the brands or companies, sold some, shut some down, outlicensed some, did some very tricky things, took Dana Buckman from Saks and Bloomies and did an exclusive license at Kohl's where it could win and make money. Maybe most importantly, I put a real focus on design and merchandising. Hired Isaac Mizrahi to come and be our creative director on Liz Claiborne. I knew that when I arrived, I commissioned some studies with the consumer to actually find out was the brand dead? I actually worried that it was dead. As Isaac would say, it, once, it had gone so granny that there was even a question, was the brand even culturally relevant? But to my surprise, what I found was, maybe not on this little island called New York City, Manhattan, in the heartland of America, like Parsippany, New Jersey, you know, Paramus, and all points west, the brand had, a, it, was a, it was a cultural icon, and the consumers at, 
the ratings and view of the brand didn't match our mistreatment of the brand. So I knew that there was an opportunity to revitalize it, but knew that the consumer would need it would need the consumer would need a reason to reconsider the brand. And I, I felt that the, the right way to start was with a, with a master designer who understood and got his mind around the mass market, but at the same time would, would have the same standards for product in terms of price value, quality, and design sensibility that Liz herself did. And it had to be somebody that was unapologetic about the brand name. And, um, and so I, I brought Isaac to the table. and. Um, and that started a turnaround there. I brought John Bartlett for the, Liz Cla for the Claiborne men's business, which is just getting its start, and systematically went through Juicy, Lucky Brand Jeans, Kate Spade, the DKNY jeans uh, license that we have, and, and, and beefed up the um, merchandising and design management, and started talking about a, a culture change. It's, it's been a heck of a journey. It's, it's, uh, it's had it, we've had our highs and lows. Um, like I said, we're, I'd say we're about halfway through it, and this economy is going to make it really, uh, it's going to make it harder. But at the end of the day, what we've done is we have streamlined, we've completely reorganized our, around our brands, and we've said the creative cultures need to step up. So th there are a thousand stories that I could tell inside each and every one of those. I believe the brand portfolio that we have right now is, is it's the right portfolio. We, there's lots of discussion around talent and earnings and those kinds of things. But what I see is I see five businesses that have incredible potential for growth, way early in their S-curve of development that have a big future in front of them, and then a sixth brand, the Liz Claiborne core business, that's in the process of reinvention. And there are a lot of lessons learned that, that, that affect how you view or look at a business and how you think about your own career. And, ter and, and, and this is where the two points that I wanted to discuss begin to merge. As you think about your career, you know, some of the things that I'll tell you are this, I think you probably know this, you might, some of you might be potential designers, some of you might be on the marketing side, some of you might be going into merchandising, but at the end of the day, what you need to know is the people that are successful in this business, it's a very remarkable business, I've been in lots of different industries, it, this is a business that those that are, that are successful, they understand, they have a willingness and an ability to understand all parts of the business and to have equal respect for all parts. First of all, I would tell you, see yourself as a business person and see yourself as a creative person because there is no way to separate those two roles in one of these businesses. Isaac Mizrahi is one of the best business people I have met and worked with in this industry. He's also one of the most creatively talented. Pam and Gila, that founded and ran Juicy Couture, our founders out there, are two of the smartest creatives and business people I have met in this business. Gene and Barry, the founders of Lucky, the same thing. Deborah Lloyd, creative director over at Kate Spade, the same thing. And so I would tell you that it's very easy to niche yourself into a part of the business, but I would tell you at this stage of your career and where you are in the learning, I would tell you that you have to go into it knowing that you actually have to be accountable for everything. What, what, what do I mean when I say the best, the best creatives are the best business people? They, they know how to value engineer a garment. They know how to listen to a merchant who might say cashmere, v-neck, lightweight sweaters are going to be the items that sell this year. That might not be what you as a designer want to focus on, but you're going to listen to that and you're going to do a creative interpretation of that item that has the potential of being a bestseller and bring a tremendous amount of creativity to it. You're going to have the interest, the tenacity, and the ability to understand how the sourcing side of the business can make you or break you and how to take advantage of it in such a way so that it, you make the best possible, or as I call it, irresistible product. On the other side of the equation, if you're a merchant, you, you equally have to have the aspiration and drive to have the innovative, differentiated product and appreciate what design can bring to the table and know that as the merchant, it's your job to extract the best creative brilliance 
from the design team that you work with. And I, again, I'll tell you, in almost every industry that I've been, the people that get it, the people that are a success, one of the aspects or one of the characteristics they bring to the table is that ability to quarterback uh, all parts of, of, of the career or all parts of the value or all, all different functions of the job. So that gets to a very important piece of advice, which is really to challenge your weaknesses. You know, for those of you that say, oh, I don't do math, I don't add numbers, or that say, I don't get into finances at all, I'm really just a product person, I, I will tell you, I could take you to our best designers or merchants at Juicy, and they would say, yeah, that's the first thing that they learn their way around. In other words, they get into the job and they discover that they have to confront that thing that they would rather pawn off onto somebody else. So confronting your weakness now, I'll tell you, there was, I think it was seventh grade when I had like really bad grades in math. And something in me said, I'm going to conquer that. Well, I ended up being an economics and math major in college. And I'm telling you, there wasn't a, a high-level math class in college that I didn't completely ace. Well, in, back in seventh grade, it was, I was afraid to take a class. And I do think that taking on this notion that you're going to conquer your weakness is one very important theme that you need to take as you think about this career path. This is a career path filled with things that talented, creative people don't want to do, okay? When you actually get into the jobs, all of a sudden you find out that the fashion industry is, it, it, there are, of the 12 things that you could do in a day, 11 of them are, quote, no fun, all right? But it's all a part of being great and being a success. And Liz Claiborne herself used to say she would run bestseller meetings and sit down and she'd want to hear the nitty gritty. She would herself ask for reports of what sold yesterday. And that would inform her. It didn't destroy her creativity. It ignited her creativity. The other piece of advice that I give you, and, and I say this to a room of people that I think are already pretty enlightened on this, is f find your passion and success will find you. Now, I say that because this is an industry of passion. And the fact that you all have already self-selected and you've shown up at FIT says you've done something very right. There are less courageous people who decide to go into banking, who decide to go into consulting, and fraud themselves about what their true talents and passions are. You're already here. However, I would tell you, stay the course. Stay the course. And I don't just mean stay in fashion, but I, I mean understand what you're really good at and what you love and be dogged about it. And I'm telling you, success will find you. You know, for the people that, that go against something that they believe in or want to do because they think that there's going to be money there, it never works that way. Never works that way. So at, on one hand, I'm saying confront your weakness. And on the other, I'm saying, you know, f follow or, or chase your passion. And they, all of that works to you being your best. Um, remembering, never ever forgetting that this is a business. Uh, you know, there, it, it, it is a huge, huge trap. Um, and I won't name names, but I can tell you that I've worked with some of the m most award-winning top names in design that refuse to believe that this is a business and that the commercial side matters. But, you know, Anna Wintour herself will tell you that you may first get success on the commercial side, but that's always what lends credibility and respect on the artistic side to the business. So keeping that connection, I think, is a very important part of it. Um, I will also tell you that you, you've got to be a total believer. I don't know any of you in this room. I literally haven't looked at a list of who's here. So this is an uninformed point of view. But I will guarantee you that w at least one person that's sitting in this room right now in 10 years will be a big, huge commercial success, a known name, an award winner. I, j I guarantee it. I guarantee it. And you've got to sit there and believe that it's not preordained which one of you it is. But that, it's about how the numbers work. And I do believe, I've only been in this industry for two and a half years, but I can tell you I bring a certain level of objectivity to this, and I can tell you that this is an industry re that rewards, not always evenly, but it rewards those that work the hardest. Yes, it rewards great talent, but it rewards hard work, maybe even more.
okay? So it's, it, the pursuit, it's worth it. And it is a, I mean, it is a, an incredibly hard business, but I will tell you, it's one that will endure all the economic cycles. Sure, there are a lot of companies going bankrupt out there. Sure, there are a lot of companies with tough numbers and tough situations, but this is an industry that endures and endures. So those are my themes. That's my, that's my you know, sort of prepared remarks. I can tell you stories. I can answer any questions you want. I'd like you all to direct me towards you know, what really matters. I mean, Alice said at the beginning, she likes me to talk to you guys because she likes me to make the point that this is an industry where if you don't change or innovate, you will die. And our company was nearly proof of it. We really were. We bought a lot of companies, but we had our focus on the wrong thing. You can't acquire your way out of really being good at product. At the end of the day, all this industry is about, we live and die on how good our product is every season. And if it's not great, it'll show up in your numbers eventually. So that's the last point I'll make. So let me ask, let me, let me take, if there are any questions. Yeah. When do you see a turnaround in the, in the economic recession, like the one that we had? When do you see a turnaround and things getting better? So this question is, where do, when do I see a turnaround in the current economy? I have a pretty bearish view. And I had a bearish view before Lehman Brothers went under and everything else. Um, I think it's 2011, and I don't think it's a full recovery. I think it's finding a new normal redefining a new normal. You know, there's all this talk, is it going to be, is the, is, is the correction going to be a W? Is it going to be an L? I think it's somewhere in between. I think that there are going to be these shocks of volatility where news feels good, then it gets bad. But my view is there are two things that will, that will aside from the banking crisis, which I think this government has gotten their arms around in an extraordinary way. It isn't fixed, but they're, what they're, Pouring at it is, I think, sufficient to fix that side of it. The combination of the mortgage foreclosures and the, 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 the junk underlying securities in all of these big banks. I think that's going to be fixed. I think the two big issues are corporate capital spending, corporate, corporate capital expenditure, and unemployment. And this is what I think. I think that just as um, expansion and growth build momentum, I think that destruction like this builds momentum too. And my sense is that I believe that unemployment numbers are going to rise until the first quarter of 2010. Because many businesses or most businesses do their CapEx planning. Capital spending is investments not in, in marketing and not in employment. It's investments in property, plant, equipment. For us, capital spending is opening new stores in malls, okay? Or new fixtures in department stores, okay? Um, or it's IT systems, all right? So every corporation in the world right now is in a free fall on their capital spending budget. I took ours in 2008. Our CapEx budget was $200 million. This year, it will be 60. Now, the ripple on effect in terms of employment in the economy is huge. It means I'm not hiring, you know, legions of IBM consultants to write new code for a new merchandising system. It means, uh, you know, I opened 125 stores last year, I'm only opening 12 this year. Okay? So, because most companies do their capital spending budgets for a year, they're planning between September and November. And because I don't believe that the fundamentals on a company's P&L will be any better in September, October, and November, I think that they will plan another year of very low capital in 2010. And I think that by the time two, 2010, so companies will hold their very low level of capital spending, unemployment will continue to unravel as companies look to cut their costs to the level of, of demand so that they can get profitable or achieve the level of profitability their shareholders demand. And I think that's going to take until first quarter. Then I think that we'll have some stability. And I think that by the time the capital spending 
cycle begins in 2010 for 2011, I think that we'll see enough of a correction that companies will have the confidence to go back and invest real capital dollars for 2011. That doesn't mean it's doom and gloom. That means there are going to be ups and downs and corrections in the time period between now and then. But I have told analysts and investors that our planning for our business assumes that the mode that we're in now, what we're seeing in stores, will be largely flat to slightly down all the way until that first quarter 2011. Others are, they try to be more hopeful and so they talk about a second quarter through 2010 or back half 2010 expansion. I just don't see it. I, I, I sit on the business round table, which is the top 60 CEOs in the whole country. We meet in Washington once a quarter. And you know, uh, the latest survey that we, we, they, they survey us and then we review our own blinded survey data. And the most recent survey against the, the top 60 CEOs actually was very consistent. Over 75% said that they thought that unemployment would continue to um, rise through the end of this year. So some of my math is actually corroborated by that. But the truth is nobody knows. We're in uncharted territory. But replotting the um, recession of the 1981-82, um, the stagflation in the, in the 80s, and then the 1991, 92, 93 recession. This one is really different. This one is structurally more challenging. And I do actually think, not that words matter, I think technically it's a depression because of the, the, the scope, it's, it's pervasiveness in every industry, it's affecting every single industry, it's pervasiveness in terms of um, um, geography, um, I just got back from Asia and, uh, you know, I, I, Asia is about six months behind us. Eastern Europe is worse than us. Europe is, is as bad as us right now. So, I mean, it's, the world is gripped, right, because we have a totally interlocked system. The flip on that is that the stimulus that's out there right now here represents 29% of GDP, whereas the attempt at stimulating the economy during the Great Depression was 8%. So, you know, there's some really good statistics and facts that actually buoy my confidence in our ability to get this thing going. Um, but I, it, it's, 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 it's really, it's going to be challenging. A lot, for a lot of fashion companies, believe it or not, they're just focused on surviving you know, not on thriving. So, you know, there are companies that, that you know, aren't, aren't going to make a lot of profit. They just want to make sure that their balance sheets work so that they have the liquidity and they keep their distribution, but it's a, it's a big challenge. What you read about in the Wall Street Journal, the story about Saks Fifth Avenue marking everything down in early November to 70 percent, that wiped out the entire fourth quarter profit pool for the industry because everybody had to follow and in their own stores or in department stores. And the most profitable six weeks of the year for every one of us in this industry are start about two weeks before Thanksgiving to New Year's. And it gutter ball. I'm doing I'm doing well on the chair here. Bill, yeah. I hate to do this. Yeah. Can you move the table under the light? Because they're taping you. Oh, they're taping me. Okay, sure. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? <laughs> What's that? Okay. Okay. I liked it better back there. Um, given like the, the realization of how many people were living on credit before the credit crisis, do you see this softening of the retail market as something that's long term and really going to affect how people are buying, or is, or is this something that we'll see in and into when people are going to go back to the way that they were buying? Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you contrarian and conflicting views wrapped into one. Okay. This is Darwinian, okay? Th this particular recession, it's why I said I hate it when people say, when do you think it's going to come back? I'm like, I grab people and say, it is never coming back. That was then and this is now. And, and, and so th this is going to change industry. And what I mean by a Darwinian one is the structure of industry changes, the number of competitors, the dynamics between channels, the price thresholds and price sensitivities, promotion sensitivity, the fundamentals, okay? 
Now, the flip of that is that, yes, the American consumer, duh, no surprise, was living beyond their means. And it, we are a creature that have done that in the past. However, if you go back to consumption levels in the 80s and 90s, that in fact, which is what I think will happen, I think that we'll go back to savings ratios and credit spending ratios like we had in what I will tell you, maybe some of you are too young, was the boom glory years of the Clinton administration. Those were pretty good times as I recall them, and meaning an expanding economy. We, you guys have just lived bubble to bubble. You've lived from one bubble, which was the, the, the tech boom, to another bubble, which as it turns out was the credit bubble. There are, frankly, too many stores, there are too many brands, there's too much supply for what will be a new lower level of demand. But you have to have faith in equilibrium. Okay? The market will find itself. That's why this is Darwinian. Some companies will go under. They need to go under. And there will be fewer of them, but the ones that are there will be very, very good. And there will be plenty of jobs. There will be. There will be jobs. Um, it, it's hell going from one equilibrium to the next. But that's what's going to end up happening. And uh, America will always be a place that's consumer-centric, where people are impulse shoppers, where they live on wants more than needs. I used to, when I, when I worked at a pharmaceutical company, I used to be frustrated at the amount of money people spent on cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, and clothing, and complained that they didn't want to pay their $5 copay. People don't take their kids to the doctor because of a $5 copay, and they're outraged by it, but they'll think nothing of spending whatever. We're going to keep being that way. So we, as an industry, we're going to be okay. It, it, we're not going to become extinct. But like I said, there, there, are, there were a lot of bad businesses and bad business models that were only making it because of the excess that was there. So, you know, I mean, uh, you know, there are some department stores that, I mean, I got to be honest with you. It, this is going to be a shakeup for them. It's already happened, right? Boscov's as an example. Um, but there'll be, there'll be more where it's a little bit like GM. It's like the fittest will survive. And those that weren't fit, if they get fit, they'll survive. I will tell you that I took a lot of criticism for all that I did to the company when I first arrived because it was a year and a half in advance, almost two years in advance. It was two years in advance of this. We had our own problems. We weren't making our numbers. Everything was beginning to fall apart. But if I hadn't done what I did when I did it, we would not be in business today. It's a fact. The numbers are there. And so it's about getting fit very quickly or not making it. And that's, I can tell you, it's true in all these industries, all the way around. You know, there are too many car companies, there are too many fill in the blanks. There might be too many dry cleaners in your town, it, but, but economies find their natural order, and that's what will happen. And we will, comparative to the Europeans, we will continue to spend maybe more on credit and save less than they do, but it will come to a level that is going to be much more sustainable. But everything got out of whack. What co the annual increase in college tuitions, they're in for a huge shakeup. I mean, they, because the market would bear it. I could, go, I could go around to every segment. But I believe that the free market in the end will work um, and that this industry, like I said, is headed, you know, there are malls that won't stay open. Well, some of the malls that aren't going to make it are malls that have been on shaky economics for a long, long time. I, I hope it's not going to be like the bubonic plague. I hope it's not that kind of Darwin. I mean, I'll tell you, in October, November, and December, I couldn't sleep at night because things were really, really bad in the country. I mean, I was on these panels with the top bankers. Our banking system came this close to completely failing. This close. So. We're in, a, we're in the world is now, I mean, you're seeing the world come together, global politicians and economists in a way that is unprecedented. Not even in the 1930s did they, did they do that. And that's a good thing. I'm very optimistic about that part of it. Okay. I have one really short question. Where did you go to school? I went to Miami of Ohio, and then I went to the University of Chicago to the Graduate School of Business for an MBA. 
design majors specifically, where would you suggest, you know, starting to like be exposed to business? It's not from like, you know, there are a lot of real world things going on right now, but but in terms of like learning and where would you I'm not sure I'll have the best answer, but let me kind of just wing it, okay? The first step is to become totally curious about all of the elements that go into making a garment immediately after you design it on a sketch pad into becoming what we'll call technically designed into becoming manufactured to then shipped and delivered to a source and understanding all of the things that, are go that, 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 that have to happen, breaking out what we call the value chain. And then with that curiosity, the curiosity will answer the question, find people that are smart about it or expert in it. Expose yourself to it. Starting by caring is my biggest message to you. Too many really, really good des design candidates decide that they are at the top of the house, the top of the pyramid, everything else is below them, and other people will come with brooms and dustpans and fix that up. And when you've decided that, you've just ended your career. Or you've put a real limit on it. I really believe that. Uh, I'd like you to raise your hands. How many of you are fashion design majors? Raise your hands. Awesome. How many are Good, it's like half and half. No, yeah, well, did I thought that would be it. Yeah, it is. It is. And I you guys are you live in two you live in a world where you're totally dependent on each other. And rare is it that you'll find the most brilliant designer who happens to be an unbelievable merchant. I could name some, okay? Isaac is one of them. That guy Every decision he makes about design is informed by an instinct on merchandising. This is a rare, rare skill. But you don't need to have this skill. If you can hone it, great. Care about it, be open to it, and understand that one does not live. It's a mutually parasitic situation. The parasite dies if the host dies. It doesn't matter which is the parasite and which is the host. Okay? It, you rely on each other very, very, very much. Okay? And, and be curious about it and understand how it works and say to yourself somewhere in your career, all you want to do, it's like if you work at an ad agency, I didn't tell you my first job out of, college, or out of business school, I worked at an ad agency, a great big one. I worked on Procter & Gamble business. That's how I got hired to Johnson & Johnson. And so I was in account services or client services, so a very creative environment. And I will tell you that the great, great, great creative teams at an ad agency has a writer and an art director. And they are like a couple. They're a couple. They're totally codependent. They mutually respect each other. Some of the great copy ideas come from the art directors, and some of the great visual concepts come from the writers. It's, they're just a team, okay? You want to, I'm just telling you, you want to be open to finding that unbelievable partner. And some of you will be ambidextrous, and you'll have the ability to do that and care a whole lot about sourcing. And include, but being inclusive is it's absolutely the paradigm of success. I see it in my company over and over. I'm, I am in all these different businesses all week long, all day long. And whether it's in Amsterdam at our business at Mex, which is a billion dollar business all based in Europe, or whether it's in Canada, whether it's in, at Juicy or Lucky in Los Angeles, whether it's at Kate Spade on 25th Street, whether it's in Isaac Studio, it, it's all the same. That's the key success factor. So really, honestly, I, I would say by, putting, by letting your curiosity get the best of you and putting yourself on a mission, you can network, you can meet people, you can challenge yourself with an internship in the area that you have no, you, you know, put yourself in an, in, in, in an internship in, in sourcing, knowing that you don't want to do it for a living, but you, you know, um, surround yourself, build a network as you when you get into the company, build a network of people in those other areas, content area experts that can be your problem solvers, that you can pick up the phone and say, how do I get this done? And no, you know, I met with um, a designer that was 
Uh, she graduated from Otis out in Los Angeles. She graduated from Otis last June. And I do these lunch and learn things where I'll take five people at all different levels of the company in a div division and I'll sit down and say, what works and what doesn't work? What's really broken? And oh my God, she burst into tears when I asked what was broken because she is, we have a horrible system out there, um, um, an ERP system that we're actually, based on this conversation that I had with her, we're getting rid of. But what was amazing was she told me what she's been doing since she got out of Otis. And she started crying because she just said I, she never in a million years dreamed that she would spend 11 twelfths of her time on the technical side of design and 1 twelfth on the creative side. And I think a lot of people will tell you when you first get out of here that might be what it's about. Understand, make the most of it while you're doing it. Now, the little glitch that, that she was speaking to had to do with a system that we were rolling out that frankly we shouldn't be rolling out. And it was requiring a doubling of the time. So she should be spending probably for her job between half and two-thirds on technical and the balance on the creative side. But when you're right out of here, right out of Otis, that's what happens. Make the most of it. So what is the best way to earn the merchandising in a side of industry and business as a fashion design student? Maybe getting an internship at like merchandising department, something like that? You know, I don't know that I know that. I mean, I just want to be honest. I'm sort of in the clouds here when, you know, in terms of my job, in terms of from your viewpoint, what's the right next step? So the question was, you know, if you're, a fashion, if you're in the fashion design program, what's the best way to learn merchandising? I mean, the f one thing about this industry is there's a lot of dirt under the fingernail knowledge that you accumulate. The key is not to flick it out. The key is to, get, to accumulate it and learn it. Um, I don't know whether Alice, you know, will have a point of view on that or uh, around here what the, I should have an answer. I should say, you know, there's a silver bullet. You, you can go into this program or take this. I mean, for me, cross-train. Okay, cross training is a great thing. So when I went to the University of Chicago, I went in there, I was a finance scholar. I was in the FAMA program for finance. So I got this whole great big scholarship to go and finance. Well, guess what? Find your passion, success will find you. I took one required marketing course and thought, oh my God, I love this. I love consumer behavior. I love figuring that out. And so I started taking more and more and more marketing and I left the school with a, a, a joint marketing and finance degree and then went into marketing. Went straight into advertising, okay? And so while you're here, I, I don't know how your program works, but I know you can enrich yourself in terms of curriculum. And you'd be shocked at how one course changes your whole view for your whole career. You know, it's a shame when people have the blinders on. But again, this curiosity thing, you know, if you, if you go in, in your first job or in your, in, your, your first internship, you don't have to literally go and do the job in order to be good at the cross development. You want to be open to it. You want to learn. You want to find a merchant that, that can teach you things. In your first job, find a killer great merchant and say, I just, I want to have an open relationship with you where I can sit down and I can come to you and ask you these kinds of things. Learn their language. Learn how they think. Learn to think like them. Learn to think like from their frame. And the next question is, what uh, does Liz Cleveland offer to put people on that level, coming in as an intern. Okay, so this question was, what does our company offer for people coming in? Well, we, we do have an internship program. It's a big one. It's one of the industry's best. And one option would be to cross-train as when you go in that way. If you don't want to do that, you know, when you get into an internship, I mean, I have a view of what internships should be. Internships, I, I, on internships I say, be selfish. Okay, be selfish. Make it like a class. Go in it to learn something, not as some optic on your resume. No, it okay. needs to be. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, you know, none of these internship programs, I don't care whether they're at Johnson & Johnson, IBM, Liz Claiborne, at the White House, you know, uh, I don't care where it is, all right? All internship programs, what they have in common are that they are, they can give you a lot of exposure, but it's not like the real job. Okay? So I believe that the, an internship is what you make it. 
of it. So it's the network that you develop, the people that you ask questions to, and the insight that you get on other people's jobs by asking them. There's some learning by doing. There's some learning by observation. There's some learning through osmosis. But a lot of it just has to do with the relationships that you form and the questions that you ask. The problem is when you're in your position, you don't know what you don't know. You don't even, sitting there, I was in your chair. You don't even know what you don't know. And so what curiosity gets you, curiosity, it will, it will get you to inquire about things and it'll surface issues, opportunities, things about yourself. I always said, hey look, I might be going down the wrong path. I might, if I go and be a finance intern, I may actually find out that I hate finance. Well, that's a success. That's not a failure. That's like a really good thing. Thank God. You know, I found out I hate banking. Okay, and now I'm not going to be a banker. Now what? Um, and so I think our, our internship program is not that different than others. I think sometimes you, you get it lucky and you land in a position where you get a ton of accountability and you have real deadlines. And sometimes you get one where you're really a fifth wheel. And, but you know what? You, it really comes down to I've never landed in a job where I didn't make it a huge opportunity for no other reason than I'm just incredibly ambitious and curious. And I just don't waste time. You know, I mean, I, I find work everywhere I go. I haven't had a calm moment on a weekend because that's just who I am, you know? And I think that if you're really, really resourceful and you have a ton of initiative and you go into it with a glass half full, it, it, you, you can't let yourself be a victim by an internship. But you have to recognize that an internship, it isn't going to be like you've got one year, you're one of the lead designers on a business or lead merchant. You know, uh, honestly, have the strength of your convictions. My answer to this question over here was really to say the world didn't just come to an end. It, look, it's scary. It's a rough time. Um, but what, what I would do is you might, not, you might not have what you wanted when you graduate. You might not have the job that you wanted. Don't measure that as when I got out of University of Chicago, um, I didn't get the job that I wanted. Before I got the advertising job, I went off and did something different for a year. And the reason was I was the youngest person in my class. I was the only person that went from undergrad straight there. And most people, the average is four years. And it handicapped me. I had no job experience. So I didn't get one of the dream jobs. And so I just knew what I wanted to do. And I settled for something different. I made the most of it. I built a great resume. And then I talked myself into a job at Leo Burnett in Chicago. And and to you, you don't know this, your life is just beginning. It is, you know, and the race is long. And don't measure yourself based on, right now, the job you got coming out of here. It, that's not, it's not a reflection of what, you're, what is going to happen to you in your career or what this investment in this program delivered to you. Tenacity, tenacity. Yes, the masses are unemployed. Yes, more jobs are coming undone than anything. It, it, this is an industry about striking a match and you know, throwing it on the ground and getting it caught. That, that, that's what has to happen. So keep your passion. Figure out where you want to land. Dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and find a way to make that work. But just don't be discouraged is my best advice. This is the timing on one hand may be awful, and on the other hand, who knows? You know, I happen to think you're in a better position, the position that you're in today, than those that graduated last June, and many of which are, are losing their jobs. And you could say, well, why? What's the difference? I, I, I just think that the psyche of being in your position, I think it's better. I graduated from University of Chicago in June of 1987. Um, nine out of 10 of my peers went to Wall Street. And nine out of 10 of them lost their jobs in the October 1987 stock market crash. Seriously. And at that time, there I was in a consulting firm. No one, you know, and by the way, I wasn't doing like big fancy consulting. It was awful stuff. And, you know, people called me and said, oh my God, could I get a job there? Well, I mean, they had just made fun of me three months before for doing that. And so you just, you have to have a long view of your life plan. And it's, uh, as anyone will tell you, your life plan, I, I didn't think two, th four years ago that I'd be running a fashion company. I didn't think in those terms. I don't know what I'll be doing in seven years. You know, I, I, for me, I can do anything. That's my view. And so uh, you just keep it on that level and know that what's happened here is, is 
It's big, big shakeout stuff, but there'll be great opportunity for you. You have a great credential. Coming from here is, it's as good as it gets. Really is. You never do. <laughs> you never ever know. Get ready to live with unbelievable risk, ambiguity, and uncertainty. It's the only constant you never know. I mean, I, I, all those years, all those moves at J&J, &J, I was promoted into those things and there wasn't an option. But I'd say to my wife every time, oh my God, this is going to be the end of my career. I don't know anything about pharmaceuticals. I mean, chemistry, microbiology, anatomy, engineering. I mean, and I had to become masters at those things. And they weren't things that I self-selected into. I was a marketing guy that ended up running a big pharmaceutical company and spending my day in science. You learn as you go. You learn as you go. You learn, you learn, here's what you learn about yourself. You learn that in life, you really can land on your feet. You really can. And once you know that about yourself and believe in that, it takes all the fear of the world away, right? Because, I mean, you'll truck on if you want to truck on. But I will also tell you, you don't get anywhere without taking a lot of risk. I mean, you just don't. And you've got to be open to it, and you've got to be accepting, and you have to accept that life is a big journey, and that you don't control stuff. But what you control, like I said, landing on your feet is about the common elements of you're going to respect others, you're going to be curious, you're going to be cross-functional and cross-trained, you are going to you know, be a completely accountable person. I talk about it as unstoppability, and this really really gets to your question. You have to, right now is the time when you need to be unstoppable. What does that word mean, unstoppable? Like, what does that mean when I say that? It means you can't be stopped. Right? Whoops. There we go. Even that. I mean, it means you cannot be stopped. Okay? Well, what, what, distinguish that for a second. So what do I mean it can't be stopped? Well, you, what, worst case, you get fired, you lose your job. Does that stop you? No, you move on, right? Um, you know, you take all kinds of huge challenges in your personal life and, and you keep going because you distinguish in your mind you cannot be stopped. And when you make that decision and you really believe in that, uh, there's just this amazing power to that. And that's ultimately, it's the esoteric answer I give you. Don't be stopped by this. You know, be just tenacity wins. Okay, the types of things to save Liz Claiborne. Um, number one, number one, I said that this is a company that if everything isn't really about making irresistible product, then no matter what we do on the business side, it won't work. So the, I took those, I coined those two words, irresistible product, and I said, that is our first aim. Everyone that works here, the finance people, the sales people, the operations people, the designers, the merchants, boom. Number two, we are going to make it exciting creatively again here. And we are going to be the place that the creative community of New York regards as the best place to work. And that may take five years, but that's what we're going to do. Number three, I said we got we to gotta focus our business on businesses that have a big, bright future. We had too many businesses that were sunset businesses, and we had some very strong sunrise businesses. And so I cleaned out the portfolio. Like I said, I sold businesses, I closed some, I licensed some, but realigned the portfolio to where we would have the resources to deliver growth in them. So it was a focus on Juicy, Lucky, Kate Spade, a reborn and rebirthed Liz Claiborne, the Monet jewelry business, which is jewelry is, you know, the necklace is the new handbag, and that is a very special business, and it's all design, and there are a thousand things that we're going to do on it that are exciting. The MEX business in Europe, that's the portfolio. That's what we're working on in, in DKNY jeans, which had been working very well because, frankly, it was a license and it was sort of sheltered from the corporate center. And then I said we would put, take, we totally redeployed cost. We, uh, I eliminated 2,700 jobs so that we could add some jobs, add back positions in design and merchandising and spend money in marketing. Um, and, and we have done that. And um, I talked about the creative appointments on, the, on some of the businesses that were absolutely positively essential. On all of them, the biggest thing 
underneath it that I did that you haven't read about in the press is I then reorganized the whole corporation. We had been organized in departments. Licensing was a department. The licensing department had a president. They licensed every item in the company. They never talked to anyone else. The next group over was supply chain and sourcing. They handled all of that and they never worked with anybody else. They had all the brands. Retail. They could open a store in any given brand. There was no brand management. So the people that worked on handbags were designing things for Ellen Tracy and Sigurd Olson that didn't look anything like or reflect what we were doing lifestyle-wise in apparel. I mean, it was, it was crazy. So I've created totally cleavable separate companies, fully integrated operating companies. Juicy has a CEO and it's run as if it were its own company. Highly decentralized the whole place and got rid of all those functional departments that had all the brands and nobody was talking. Yeah, so the question is, is there a global opportunity? It's huge. It's one of the big conclusions we came to was that this giant corporation that we had, nobody was focusing on opportunities outside the U.S. We were frankly an ugly American company other than Mex, which is not here. Mex is, it's in Canada and it's all throughout Europe. Mex has its own challenges, but it has a good focus on those markets and on Asia. Um, but the big opportunity is, is, is absolutely positively global expansion. So we, we have hired real international development people for each of the businesses, and we're in the process of, of right now, we're going we're gonna to open Juicy in Western Europe on our own. We do it through our, our, our office in London. We have our first retail store opening there. We have wholesale in, in, in England, and we're opening wholesale now on the continent, in the five large continental Western European countries. And in most of Asia is handled through licensees, and we're either re-upping those licenses, forming them, or strengthening them. It's a huge opportunity. When you get down to fewer brands and you form separate companies, those companies are responsible for thinking all the opportunities geographically, in terms of product categories, and in terms of, of, of channels. More questions? Yeah. Are you thinking of introducing Max to the United States? Nope. Um, we actually had six stores for Max here when I started and I closed it. And I closed it because it's called Profit from the Core. Max can be five times the size that it is in Germany, but to do it we have to spend a lot of resources. If I tried to open Max in the United States and really get it to a critical mass level, the resources that it would take here, I could triple the business in France and Germany and have a bigger business. So I just, uh, you know, I have no, I have no desire. It was closed because we lost $25 million a year on that business in the United States. It was the simplest decision I've ever made. It was going nowhere. We had expensive real estate. I turned that store on, that's on Fifth Avenue at 52nd Street into a juicy store that will gross over $45 million this year. It was doing, <laughs> it was doing $11 million at, as a max. So it, the idea there is you don't have to be in every market. You really don't. And you want to position against your strengths. And Mex has an incredible, Mex is like the Liz Claiborne brand in France, Germany, and Benelux. And yet the same paradigm was going on. We had no creative energy on it. We had bad product. My focus is to fix that business in its core market. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great brand. It's a sexy brand. Yeah. Do you? Well, you know, that's what everybody told me. So I realized again, like the Liz Claiborne business, there is some, I've got some big, wild, exciting news coming on that business soon. You do? You come from Amsterdam? I go every week, every week for a day. Wow. That's, you're going to love what happens on that business. I wish I brought some marketing images to show you what we've just done. It's really good. Yeah. Well, keep holding on to it. 20 years ago, that was the best product. It was a good brand then. It was good five years ago. It just lost its way in the last five years. Yeah, we're bringing it back to what it was. Yeah. Urban, diverse, European, sexy, city. Right? Are those the right words? A little corrupted, you know? Yeah. Um, do you advise going straight to grad school? Or no, I don't. Experience? I don't. 
I don't. I did it. It was right for me. I don't regret it because I don't ever regret anything. I do forward, not reverse. But, you know, I have three kids. My oldest son is 21, and he's sitting there saying to me, gee, Dad, should I go straight to graduate school? And I say, uh-uh, I'm not letting you. Get out, work two or three years. It was hard for me. Not hard. I was super ready to keep going in school. I wasn't done. But it's the, the business world, it's just great to get out and learn about yourself before you go back to school. Going back to school is the greatest treat you'll ever, if you do it, it's the greatest, greatest, most wonderful treat. And if you go straight through, you won't appreciate it. It's just, a, it's just two more years or three more years as opposed to the, an amazing personal retreat and investment after you've appreciated being in the workforce. And then you get, you start all these myths about yourself, I don't care Every one of you has some myth about yourself in terms of what you like and don't like, and you'll discover that myth when you get to work. And some other perceptions will be validated, but some will be invalidated. And it's just good to work off of that knowledge. <laughs> Oh, it, you know, this is the shit you have to tune out right now no, I'm just because saying, it's I'm just saying, insane. Though, Here's the I'm deal. My wife and I got married very young. We met each other in college. We both went to graduate school together. She has had a career absolutely as successful as mine, at least on a financial measure. She owns a publishing company. We have three children. We had them young. One of my kids is autistic. This has not been an easy thing. I took paternity leave for two of them. We've traded off everything as we've gone. It, there's no time, there's no good time to have a kid. People that are like planning their career and saying, when's the right time to have a kid? Never. It's never a good time. So just have it now. You know, I mean, that's what I say. Here's. The end, no, 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 I know. But the answer is I keep the two in totally watertight compartments. And watertight compartments, by the way, this isn't just about kids. It's, it's having a life outside of work, whatever your lifestyle, is really important. It is really important to have someone and something that sucks you out of that. I, I, I never had the option, honestly, in all those years climbing the ladder of staying till midnight. I didn't stay to midnight one night of my life. I didn't. I had kids at home. I mean, and it would be like, sometimes my wife would say, I've got a meeting. She had to go to, out of town, this or that or whatever. And it was like, uh, just not a choice. And so I never wasted a minute at work. I haven't had a lunch hour, honestly, ever. I mean, you know, I'll have business in town on lunch, but I mean, like, go out with someone for lunch? What? But I boxed myself in, uh, you, know, you know, and I think it made me better. I do. I think it constrained my resources and made me smarter, made me wiser. And, um, but I think that, 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 that kids or no kids, you want to have a real life. And you want to draw the line and you want to have barriers. My wife has a rule. My Blackberry's not allowed on the second floor of our house. Okay? She said, you can run around the first floor with it, but it's not coming upstairs. Great rule. Because I look at that Blackberry and I become like a monster. It's like, ooh, you know? And I get sucked into a phone call or, you know, all the joy on my face will shrink away because I got to go do something. And that's a great rule. So, you know, you help each other with that. Yeah. I struggle with that a lot. It, it, end the debate with yourself. Because if you debate it, the devil will win, right? Because all of logic says you can't do both. Bullshit. You don't have a choice. We are human. We are human. I, I just think it makes you better. I do. And I just say, you know, like I said, kids or no kids, whatever your lifestyle, it, 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 it is as important for a single person to have fully developed outside interests as a married person with kids. But just treat it as a non-issue. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, well, it probably is. Uh, we, we should. I love this dress. I hope you like it. 
Oh, yeah, it's a great class. Great class. Good deal. Good luck, everybody. Keep your courage. Be unstoppable. That's the answer to all this mess. Okay. Sure, sure, sure.